How many of you have been enjoying the uh, series that we've been in from the Holy Land, from, from Israel? I'll tell you what, there's nothing like being there and, and seeing and experiencing all those different places. And, you know, some of the places that you go to in Israel and they'll say, you know, we believe this is where this happened. And then there's other places where they say, this is the spot. And um, so it's pretty amazing to think, you know, some of those places, it's right where Jesus stood. It's, it's where the, uh, this happened with King David and, and uh, so phenomenal uh, experience for me actually to go. How many of you would love to go to Israel one day and experience that? Uh, we're going to make sure you do. I think every Christian ought to go to, to Israel. And so we, have diff- we, we actually have different tour trips that we take throughout the year. You can jump on one of those and be a part of that. Uh, I know it would, would, change, would change your life as it has changed mine. I want you to get your Bibles and go over to the book of Acts. We're going to go into part three of this series uh, in one of the most amazing stories in the Bible where Peter has that vision and he sees the sheep coming down and it really is, um, it really is God opening Peter's heart to realize that God is no respecter of persons, that he has a plan for every single one of us. This is a message all about grace and uh, I hope you enjoy it. Part three of the beginning. Let's enjoy it together. Welcome to part three in our series called The Beginning. Grab your Bibles, everybody. Turn over to the book of Acts. I'm here in Israel, the birthplace of Christianity, and we've been on this journey together the last couple of weeks through this series, going back to the beginning, to the roots of our faith, looking at some of the locations that represent powerful moments. Here's our key verse, Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. In the message, we look at this son, Jesus, and we see God's original purpose in everything created. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence, and he holds it all together right up to this moment. You know what? To find out what we're searching for, what we truly need in life, it all starts with Jesus. Through the series, we're talking about the fact that Jesus is the beginning. He's the beginning of four things. He's the beginning of new life. He's the beginning of transformation. He's the beginning of grace and purpose. This week, we're talking about grace. Turn over to the book of Acts chapter 10. I'm here in a place called Joppa. The Jewish people today call it Jaffa, an incredibly beautiful place and the harbor port in the modern day city of Tel Aviv. In Jesus' day, Joppa was an important place of import and export. Israel was in a strategic position because it was the only intercontinental land bridge between the superpowers of the ancient world. This made Joppa a very significant center of activity. You might remember reading about Joppa in the story of Jonah. God sent Jonah to Nineveh to turn them from their wicked ways. But instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah comes here to Joppa and gets on a boat, which leads him to his encounter with a big fish. Well, fast forward 800 years, and it's here in this same city where Peter gets a similar call to take the gospel to the Gentiles. At the end of Acts chapter 9, we read about how Simon Peter had been traveling and visiting the believers near this area. He had just raised one of the believers in Joppa named Tabitha from the dead. And after this miracle, Peter remains in Joppa and stays with a man named Simon the Tanner. Here's what's significant about Peter staying at Simon's house. Simon was a tanner who uh, turned animal skins into leather. This is the only mention of the profession in the Bible, so we know that this detail was included for a purpose. In that day, this one detail 
would have said volumes about the situation. Because Simon was a tanner, he would have been considered unclean, both physically and spiritually. Tanners dealt with dead animals, which was forbidden by Jewish purity laws. As a result, he would have been seen as someone who didn't follow the religious laws regarding purity. And if you think about it, purely from a physical standpoint, practical standpoint, it was an incredible messy profession from, from the condition the animals arrived in to the cleaning process to the elements that they used to take the skins through the process of preservation. Tanning was known to have an incredibly strong smell, which is why tanners were typically located at the edge of town. Simon would have been at the lowest level of the socioeconomic status, meaning virtually everyone would have considered themselves superior to him. It's interesting that Peter stayed with him since he would have been considered unclean by staying at Simon's house. But not only did he stay with him, the Bible says he stayed for some time. So while Peter is staying at Simon's house, 30 miles to the north in a town called Caesarea, an angel appears in a dream to a man named Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile man of Italian descent who served as a Roman centurion, uh, similar to a sergeant in today's terms. And even though he wasn't Jewish, the Bible makes it clear that he and his family were good, God-fearing people. So let's read Acts chapter 10, verses three through six. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord, he asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. So right behind me, there is a house believed to be Simon the Tanner's house. Cornelius has this vision, calls some of his men to go to Joppa and find Peter at Simon's house. The next day, as they are on the way to Simon's house, Peter has a vision of his own. Let's read that one. Acts chapter 10, verse nine. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kind of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. And a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times and immediately the sheet was taken back up to heaven. So while Peter is sitting there wondering what this vision meant, the men Cornelius had sent arrived. Peter goes down to meet them and they explain why they're there. Peter doesn't understand the vision or why God wants him to go to Caesarea, but he senses the Lord is at work. He invites Cornelius' men to be his guest at Simon's house and the next day they leave for Caesarea. Here we are in Caesarea, a beautiful area about 30 miles north of Joppa. In the time of Jesus, Caesarea was actually the capital city of Israel. Caesarea Maritime, as it is known today, was originally founded by Herod the Great. It was a seaport built on the ruins of an ancient fortified city. Herod spared no expense and built an incredibly modern city complete with a 20,000 seat hippodrome for chariot races and a large amphitheater for gladiator events, plays, and other performances. Herod named the great city after Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor at the time, as a way to gain favor with him. Caesarea played a strategic role in the Apostle Paul's ministry. It was from the port at Caesarea that Paul set sail to preach in different communities throughout the Mediterranean. It's also the city where he spent two years in prison waiting to be transported to Rome. After Jerusalem was destroyed, Caesarea actually became the epicenter of Christianity. This is fitting because as we will see, the first Gentile conversion took place right here. Peter's obedience to take the gospel to the Gentiles produced impact that eventually came full circle as Christianity and the local church began to grow in Caesarea and around the world. As Peter arrives at Cornelius' house, he, he finds Cornelius and a group of family and friends gathered. The house is packed as Cornelius shares his encounter with the angel. 
and Peter begins to connect the dots. He begins to understand what God was trying to tell him through the vision. He tells the group, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. A few verses later, he says it even more clearly. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is a huge deal to accept people outside of the Jewish faith was a major shift in, in their history. Salvation comes by grace through faith. The Jewish people had extensive laws and requirements regarding everything, purity, economics, birth, marriage, death, ethnicity. Some of these laws stemmed from good intentions to keep God's people from taking on the practices of their pagan neighbors, to, to keep their living areas clean and, and sanitary, to keep business practices fair and full of integrity. The goal was holiness, to honor God, but as often happens, people got so focused on the what that they forgot about the why. For a good portion of, of the Jewish people, obeying these laws was no longer an act of love and reverence for God. It became a way of elevating themselves to a superior status and excluding those who they deemed inferior. But when Jesus came, everything changed. He turned the system on its head. Jesus announced a way of relating to God that wasn't characterized by external compliance to codes or rituals or ethnicity, but rather by a willingness to believe. Right standing with God is no longer something to be achieved, it is something to be received. And the same is true for you and I today. Listen to this amazing passage from Ephesians. You know this one, Ephesians 2, verses eight and nine. It says, God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. Sadly, the religious culture among the Jewish people could be very prideful. Their spiritual standing was largely based on works and could have a very exclusive mentality. But the vision Peter had leveled the playing field. All people were on equal footing before God. There was no spiritual hierarchy, no room for prideful exclusion based on a set of external circumstances. Every kind of person from every nation was welcome in the kingdom of God. In Ephesians 2, Paul makes it a point to let his audience know our salvation isn't the result of good works, but God's grace. Grace changed everything for Peter and Cornelius, who went from unequals by religious standards to being brothers in the faith, and grace changed things for us. Grace is just as powerful and life-changing for us today as when it was first revealed thousands of years ago. To fully understand the magnitude of what God has done, we have to understand what grace is. Grace is this amazing combination of forgiveness, favor, and freedom. Because of grace, our sins are washed away, that's forgiveness. We can receive God's favor, which means we didn't do anything to deserve it, and we can live in freedom. We can be who God has created us to be. I like to define grace this way, God's empowering presence that enables me to be who he made me to be and to do what he's called me to do. And there's two sides to the grace coin. God's grace that he extends to us, that's his favor, and the other side of the coin is that grace works through us to other people. Grace freely gives what has not been earned. When grace gives, it doesn't give based on condition, doesn't require anything in exchange. Grace isn't just about the action that takes place. There's also the spirit or the mentality behind it. Paul talks about the spirit of grace. When grace gives, it's an act of love, generous and pure, open-hearted and open-handed. So let's look at five things God's grace gives us. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these things down. If you're not taking notes, go ahead and jot these things down. All right, number one, grace gives me forgiveness. Ephesians 1 verse seven and eight, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. There's nothing as powerful as being forgiven. Forgiveness means that our past doesn't have to have a hold on us. Our failures don't disqualify us. Our mistakes don't define us. Grace says, I forgive you. Here's number two, grace gives me freedom. 
Romans 8, 2, those who enter into Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing me from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Grace takes the limit off. We don't have to live enslaved to anything, not to sin or our past, not to fear or insecurity. Grace means we can be secure in who God made us to be. Paul the Apostle said it best in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. When we're walking in grace, we're free to be ourselves, to rest in the knowledge that God loves us and accepts us just the way we are. Grace says, I wanna see the limits taken off of you. Here's number three, grace gives me strength. Hebrews 13, nine says, your strength comes from God's grace. Hebrews 4, 16, one verse I quote all the time says, let's approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. At some point in life, we will find ourselves in a time of need, maybe in a small way, maybe in a desperate way. Wherever we find ourselves, whatever the need may be, we have permission to come boldly to God and we will find the grace we need. Grace says, I will help you. Here's number four, write this down. Grace gives me a place. Romans 12, six, in his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. I love 1 Peter 4, 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. We have been graced for a place. God has given each of us unique gifts and those gifts are, are perfect, a perfect fit for the place that he's called you to. Grace says, I have a place for you. Don't waste your grace trying to fulfill someone else's purpose. It can be easy to compare ourselves and, and look at other people and look at other opportunities, but God has given you grace for your place, not for someone else's. Paul knew this firsthand in Galatians 2.21. He said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. I love how the Passion Translation says it. I don't view God's grace as something minor or peripheral. To view something as minor means to make it small and insignificant, to say it's, it's not enough. Paul is telling us, don't minimize the power of what God's grace can do in your life. Paul asked God multiple times to take away his thorn in the flesh. And it was obviously something that made life difficult for him or, or caused him pain. And, and God didn't take the thorn. Instead, he gave Paul grace. He told Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is enough. Grace says you can even when you think you can't. And here's number five, grace gives me acceptance. Romans 3, 22 through 24, we have been made acceptable to God and granted eternal life as a gift by his precious undeserved grace. Through the redemption, which is the payment for our sin, which is provided in Christ Jesus. Wow, how powerful is that? I'm so thankful that in all our failures, with all our flaws, in spite of all of our mistakes, God accepts us just as we are. He loves us right where we are. Now it's important to know that he doesn't want us to stay there. He wants, he wants to lead us forward out of the brokenness, out of the issues, out of the problems that maybe keep us from experiencing all that God has for us. And I think that's really important. Just, just, just as we don't wanna live with a religious mindset, with rules and regulations, we, we also can't live with a mindset that as a Christian, I can choose to live however I want and that's gonna be all right with God. That's another way of frustrating God's grace in your life. A real important part of God's grace is the presence of God convicting you of sin so you can break the habits that are holding you back so you can overcome anything that seems to be overcoming you. Grace says, I love you no matter what. Come on, can we thank God for the grace, the grace of God. Hey, here's the bottom line, everybody. God wants a relationship with you. That's what grace is all about. We're not talking about religion. Religion sometimes becomes a barrier between us and God. But Jesus gave his, his life so that we could have a relationship with God. And really, if you think about our relationship with God, there's two ways that we can, that we can approach it. We can either strive and work to earn God's approval or we can enjoy God's acceptance because of what Jesus has done for us. 
Even within Christianity, there's so many people that every day wake up and try to earn, you know, the favor of God and try to earn the approval of God. Doesn't mean we don't have to seek God. Doesn't mean we don't have to, you know, work at, at, at uh, you know, pressing in and, 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 and making him a priority, but we don't have to earn his acceptance. We get to enjoy his approval in, in our life. Come on, how many of you are thankful for that? That's the grace of God. That's God's grace. I read this, I thought it was so, so great. Uh, Gary Willis wrote, no outcasts were cast out far enough in Jesus' world to make him shun them. Not Roman collaborators, not lepers, not prostitutes, not the crazed, not the possessed, and let me add, not Peter and not Simon the Tanner and not Cornelius. No one was too far from the reach of Jesus. Aren't you thankful for that? And he wants a relationship with you. Let me encourage you today. Let God's grace come to you so it can move through you and enable you to be all that God has called you to be so that you can do all God has called you to do.